All right. Um, if you have your Bibles, we are in John 18. John 18. We're continuing our study through the Gospel of John. And over the next several weeks, we're going to be um, in passages that teach us about the death of Jesus. And so some of the details of the story are a little graphic. Um, it's a little challenging. Um, and so um, as you're here, um, just pray that God would speak to you this morning. And so let me begin this morning. John 18, we're going to be from verses 33 down all the way to chapter 19, verse 16 is our passage this morning. But let me begin this morning with, by telling you how the world began and how it's going to end. The Bible gives us these answers, and we find it at the beginning of the Bible, a man and a woman who are hanging out in a garden. God had created them. Everything around them was good and perfect. Sin was not in the world at that moment. They were naked. Life was good. And they weren't just supposed to reside in the garden, but they were to work before sin ever existed. And here was the job that God gave them. In Genesis 2, it says, God took man and he put him in the garden to cultivate it, to keep it. That word cultivate is where we get the word culture from. We are made by God to make something of this world to be creators and to be creative like our creator. He gave us the raw ingredients and he told us to make something with it and make something we did. We've created. We've created art and tools and cities and civilizations and technology. And unfortunately, because of sin, we started using culture not just for good but also for evil to suppress, to marginalized to abuse. Instead of being selfless, we became selfish. Instead of looking after others, we became oppressive and only began to look after ourselves. And instead of worshiping and glorifying God, began to worship and glorify ourselves and what we could do and what we can make and what we can be. The story of the Bible and of civilization from that point on is riddled with destruction. But when you flip the Bible all the way to the end, to Revelation, you find a new earth that the Scripture talks about, one where justice and peace reign, where all things that were wrong are now made right, where selflessness is reigning instead of selfishness, where love, joy, and peace are the air that we breathe, one that very much looks like the Garden of Eden, but it's a civilization that's full of countless people living in harmony and serving one another and worshiping Jesus. I think it's fair to say that what began in the garden and what we read at the end of the Bible is not what we see now. It's not the world that we're living. We live in a time of the in-between, of between the Garden of Eden and the new earth that God wanted to create, was going to create. And we long for that day. And we know it's coming, but we only catch glimpses of it, of that world now. In our world, there's really no peace, harmony, and worship of Jesus, but rather there's suppression, there's racism, there's marginalization, there's violence, there's senseless murders when people go to a mosque to pray and they're gunned down, there's abuse. This has led many young people in our culture, especially millennial generations, those between the ages of 20 and 36, to try to do something about it. A lot of you guys. One business professor made the observation that in his business class, he would ask the class um, earlier in his life, he would ask the class how many of them wanted to work for a Fortune 500 company, and almost every hand would rise. But beginning in around 2007, only one student each year would raise their hands to do that. They all wanted to work in a place where they could make a difference, where they could make a change in the world around them. It's a fascinating cultural movement. Andy Crouch, in his book called Culture Making, that was written about 10 years ago, did research on all the books that are in the Harvard Library, whose title, whose title included the phrase, change the world, or changing the world, or change the world. And he came up with 216 titles in the entire library. And the most interesting discovery there was that um, out of all of those books, um, half of those were written in the 1990s and after. 18 of them were written in the 1980s. Four were written in the 70s. Six were written in the first half of the century. Of the 1.5 million books in that library, zero were written. Of the 1.5 million books in the library written before 1900, zero of them had the word 
change the world or changing the world or, ch- um, or change the world in it. By the way, this is super exciting for us because as a church, we're filled with millennials who not only want to make a difference in the world that God has placed them in, but they're passionate about Jesus. And when you take passion for Jesus and a desire to change the world and you get convinced that and you convince them to be obedient to the voice of Jesus, we're talking about the power and the influence of the early church and the church of Acts that becomes visible in our generation. Our leadership is working on several things as a church right now, but at, together we're reading a book that's equipping us to better raise leaders who are passionate about Jesus, and we want to be leaders in the home, in the marketplace, in nonprofits, in for-profits, in education, in medicine, in architecture. And we're convinced that God isn't calling us to train you and equip you so that you could better serve here in the church, but that you could do ministry wherever God has placed you, that you could be leaders in your workplaces wherever God has placed you. And that is the challenge that God has called us as leaders to be able to encourage you in that. So we live in a culture that's primed for change. And because we're created in the image of God, we all have the power and the ability to to affect change. But the problem is that the same power that is meant for good is also the same power that we use for corruption. Because of the fall of man into sin, we now use power selfishly so that whatever power and influence we have, we're never content with. And we want more because we want to make a name for ourselves. So this morning, as we look at this passage, we're going to discover questions of how do we use the God-given power, influence, and gifts to serve rather than to be served? How do we see the gospel go out and affect change in the lives of people around us and in people's lives so that generations are changed for Jesus? So we're going to see how Jesus describes his kingdom and how he wants us as his followers to use our gifts, our talents, our lives to bring about a gospel resurgence in our culture. Jesus, this morning in our text, will stand before Pilate. And even though Pilate thinks he's interrogating Jesus, the reality is that Jesus is interrogating Pilate. And though Jesus has come to change the world, his way of changing the world is counterintuitive to Pilate's thinking and worldview. But if we get the gospel, we will see that it makes perfect sense. In order to see a gospel resurgence happen, our text will show us several things that we will need in our lives. And the greatest agent of change in the world is a follower of Jesus because they alone have the ability and desire to use the power that they've been given to serve because they don't need to make a name for themselves. The prophet Isaiah, God speaks through him and says, I will give you a name that's better than sons and daughters. I will give you an everlasting name that will not be cut off. So five things I want you to see from this text. Number one, the first thing we need to see if we're going to see the gospel take root in our culture and our community is we need humility. The first thing we need to understand is that we're not going to change the world through a political surge. And yet, every election, we get duped into thinking that this is what's going to happen. It has to start with our hearts. Many Christians will talk about change as if something out there needs to happen, but they never look inside to see what's going on inside of them, that this is where change needs to happen first. And here, Jesus affirms the power to change is not of this world, but is of another world. Look at verse 33. Pilate went back into the headquarters, summoned Jesus, and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, Are you asking this on your own, or have others told you about me? So Pilate's been hearing that Jesus has been calling himself a king. And Pilate ties his robes tight, and he looks at his soldiers and says, Bring him back to the back room. I want to talk to him privately. And Pilate, according to Luke, had sent Jesus already to Herod. And Herod wanted Jesus to do some miracles. He wanted Jesus to just put on a show for him. And when Jesus refused, Pilate, you know, Herod just beat him a little bit, put a robe on him, and sent him back to Pilate as a joke. And Pilate asked Jesus, who is mockingly clothed as a king standing before him, if he's the king of the Jews. And you can almost hear Pilate chuckle as he says this, right? Here's a man that's bound in a robe, and he's like, are you the king? Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus responds with putting Pilate on trial. The underlying meaning of Pilate's question is that if he wants to know if Jesus is political leader and if he's trying to lead this coup to overtake Rome. Verse 35. I'm not a Jew, am I? Pilate answered. Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? My kingdom is not of this world, said Jesus. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I wouldn't be handed over to the Jews. 
As it is, my kingdom does not have its origin here. Pilate gets offended. He's like, do you think I know your customs? Do you think I know your culture? Do you think I know about all the silly rules and festivals that you have? I don't know any of these details. And he points to the mob that's out there that's yelling at Jesus to be crucified. He says, look, your own people have brought you to me, and they want you dead. Your own community, your brothers, your sisters, they don't like you. They want you dead. What in the world have you done to make this community hate you so much? And Jesus' response is, yes, I'm a king, but not in the sense that it will ever threaten you or your power or Rome. I have power, but it's not a political power that will threaten your nation. I have a power that will change your world, but it will not be on a political stage. You see, the world attempts to preserve power and cause change be a force and violence, but Jesus' power and way of changing the world and reconciling people to himself is completely different. It's through humility. It's through service. Remember the words of Jesus, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Listen, brothers and sisters, as followers of Jesus, we don't take power and we don't seek to be served, but we serve and lead people to the one who changes their hearts and then will change lives and will change generations. And that takes great humility on our part because... It's not about us and what we can do, but it's about Jesus. You know, Christianity has never thrived in the limelight. Just look at the difference between Christianity that's going on in China and Christianity that's happening in Europe. One suppressed Christianity. The other married Christianity. One used Christianity as a power to enforce change. The other went underground to serve and see subversive change. One used Christianity to make a name for itself the other sought no name of itself. One has Christianity thriving. The other has churches that are now museums for us to walk through and visit. When the church gets in bed with politics, it loses its power. The church always thrives on the margins. It wasn't founded by a strong person who took power, but by a strong person who gave up his power. Listen, the kingdom of Jesus cannot be advanced in our culture through people who think they can enforce change through politics and procedures. It only happens through people who acknowledge that change must first happen within them and then use their power to serve and be subversive. My friends, if the gospel resurgence is going to take place in our communities, in our cities, in our neighborhoods, it has to take place, it has to begin in our own hearts at first. Until we embrace the deep truth in our soul that Jesus saved us not so that we can be served, but that so that we could serve and love and point people to Jesus, we will never see change happen in us or in our cities or in our communities, much less the world. The gospel doesn't tell us that Christ came into the world to save world changers of who we are the most important. The gospel tells us this, Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. We need to be able to see our own sin first, own our percent of the problem, and in humility look inside, and to then be able to serve others. First thing we need is humility. Second thing is we need truth. Look at verse 37. You're a king then, Pilate asked. You say that I'm a king, Jesus replied. I was born for this, and I have come into the world for this, to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Again, Jesus doesn't give an answer. He's like, yes, no, I am, uh, maybe. And Pilate's just stumped, right? I'm a king, but I'm unlike any king you've ever seen. I came to point people to the truth, and the truth will change everything. What is the truth? It's Jesus. Remember, he's already said these words. I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. And Jesus here is going after the heart of Pilate. Here he is being questioned, being about to be sentenced, and he's still working at a person's heart, pointing, trying to point them to himself. He's telling Pilate that, listen, all of your political pride and all of your political power is not what you need. It's empty. It's unsatisfying. You need truth, which is Jesus. The sad thing is that political power and position not centered on Jesus will only bring about the opposite of what a person hopes for. Pilate needed Jesus more than anything else. Listen, if you are apart from Jesus today, Know that your desire for change in culture, which appears good on the surface, 
is really a cover-up to fill the void in your heart for significance. You want truth. You want meaning. You want significance. You want to know that you matter, and so you gravitate toward influence and position and even nonprofit work to make a mark, to make a name for yourself. And this is why you will never really change culture for the good. Like Pilate, you will go with whatever is popular, whatever will keep your name good in the public's eye. In order to have influence, you have to stand for the truth, for what is right, not in arrogance, but in humility. But here's Pilate. He thinks he has all of this under control. He doesn't see that he needs, he needs Jesus. Look at verse 38. What is truth, Pilate asked. After he said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no grounds for charging this man. Pilate doesn't care about truth. He just wants to know if Jesus is a threat to his life and his position. He's pragmatic at best. Pilate is just like the rest of us. I'm my own authority. I'm the final say. And when a culture or an individual deems himself as the final authority and solution of what weighs on them, there will be large movements of racism and marginalization and violence and abuse in our culture. Man was created to live under authority, not above it. Man was not made for authority. Man wants to be sovereign, but can't. And when they try to be sovereign, they abuse because you have to put someone beneath you. They want to be God rather than serve God. And thus their hope for change will always fall short because they're ultimately only in it for themselves. Paul Tripp said it this way. He says, sin is rooted in my unwillingness to find joy in living my life under the authority of and for the glory of another. Sin is rooted in my desire to live for myself. See, this is what corrupted Pilate and every other person, and or at least will, in time. No matter how great our intentions may be, at the end of the day, we're going to do what's best for us because truth at the end of the day is what we decide is best for us. As Harvey Dent, Two-Face in Dark Nights, once said, you either die a hero or you live long enough to see the villain in yourself. See, this is why we need the truth of the gospel. Without finding our identity in the good news that Jesus lived the life that we should have lived and died the death we should have died, any influence or power we have will corrupt us. We will use power to take instead of serve. Instead of unity, service, and love, there will be disunity, abuse, and selfishness. But when we have power and influence, which we all have without the gospel, we bury the image of God in us, and instead of being loving, we become selfish. We can only give power away and spend it alongside those less powerful when we see Jesus, who had all authority and gave it up to become one like us. By using our influence and our power and gifts to serve others, you can change this world one life at a time because you've been willing to suffer and stand with those who suffer. And you get to do that because you stand in truth. Number three, suffering. Suffering. It was the suffering of Jesus and the refusal to dominate and crush his enemies, but love them and speak truth to them that caused the world to be turned upside down. You can't expect people to hear what you have to say or have changed by you until you're willing to lay aside your prejudices and your preferences and jump in the trenches with the other. That's what Jesus did. He jumped into the trenches with us. And friends, it hurt him. It cost him his life. And he writes so this way, shaping our world is never for a Christian a matter of just going out arrogantly, thinking that we must just get on with the job, reorganize the world according to some model that we have in mind. It is a matter of sharing and bearing the pain and puzzlement of the world so that the crucified love of Jesus may be brought to bear healing in the world around us. Because as Jesus himself said, Following him means taking up a cross. We should expect as New Testament followers of Jesus that to build on his foundation that we will have to find the cross etched into the pattern of our life and work over and over and over again. That is what Jesus calls us to. Look at chapter 19, verse 1. Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. In light of Jesus humbly speaking truth, Pilate takes him, has him now beaten for the third time, Every judge that Jesus has seen has beaten him mercilessly. And now this wasn't just a regular whip with long lash, uh, just a regular whip, but it was a 
cat of nine tails. It had a short wooden handle with numerous long lashes of leather that was attached to it. Each leather strip was studded at intervals with glass pieces and bones and stones arrayed so they would grab the skin and tear it to pieces. The victim would be stripped of all of their clothing and tied to a whipping post by his wrist with his hands hanging over his head to virtually lift him off the crown so that they are on their tippy toes so that the skin on their back is stretched tight. One or two scour scourge beaters called lecters would then deliver the bows, skillfully laying out the lashes diagonally across the back with extreme force. Friends, the skin would be literally torn away. Muscles were deeply lacerated. His entire back would be ripped open, resembling basically ground meat. Blood would be everywhere. Not just all over Jesus, but all over the soldiers inflicting the punishment. It looked like they, would take, they were taking a bloodbath. Few remained conscious throughout the ordeal. Many went raving mad or died in the process. Verse 2, the soldiers also twisted a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and threw a purple robe around him. And they repeatedly came to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews, as they were slapping his face. Apparently, some of the soldiers were beating Jesus. Others were picking out thorns. They were taking long thorns up to 12 inches long, and they were putting it, uh, pulling them from the vines in laughter, making a crown out of it. Condemned Roman prisoners were considered fair game for the soldiers. They were fair game for abuse as long as they weren't killed before they were crucified. And the soldiers were experts at mocking people. And they rarely had an enthusiastic crowd that would cheer them on while they did this. So they decided to take, make the most of it. Once Jesus was beaten beyond human resemblance, the guards, no doubt chuckling, put this crown of thorns on his head. The language indicates that they forced the crown on his head. Literally, two people were holding Jesus down while they pressed the thorns into his head all the way down to his skull. No doubt Jesus screamed in extre extreme pain. And then they mockingly took the robe that Herod had placed on Jesus and wrapped it around him. His back would be a mass of bleeding wounds and quivering muzzles, and the robe would only add to the pain of those wounds, especially when they made him move. Other Gospels say that they placed a reed in his hand. The reed represented a scepter for a king. One of them took the reed and, from his hand and used it to strike him repeatedly on his head. No doubt the reed served to push the thorns deeper and deeper into his head and probably causing increased blurred vision as it was pressed deeper into his skull. And then they began to come in front of Jesus and kneel before him and mock him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And after they would bow in mock reverence, scorning him, they would then haul back and punch him right in the face, a face soaked with blood because of the thorns. No doubt when they hit him, it was like a can of paint being dropped on the floor from a ladder as blood sprayed everywhere. Verse 4, Pilate went outside and said to him, Look, I'm bringing him outside to you to let you know I find no grounds for charging him. Then Jesus came out wearing a crown of thorns and a purple robe. And Pilate said to him, here's the man. Pilate then steps back and he faces the angry mob. He announces that he's about to bring Jesus to them. And he again doesn't see anything worthy of death in Jesus. Pilate hopes against hope that the crowd would see Jesus just mangled up and feel sorry for him or and say, all right, you don't have to crucify him. That's enough. And so he brings Jesus out, who's sarcastically dressed like a king. And Pilate announces, listen, here's the man. He doesn't call him a king this time. He'll be translated, poor man, this wretched creature. No doubt some in the crowd grew faint at the sight. Others threw up what they had for breakfast that morning. Others turned their head to the side, unable to set their eyes on what they looked at when they saw the image of Jesus walking in front of them. The soldiers had beat him till he was unrecognizable. The prophet Isaiah says it this way, as many were astonished at you, your appearance was marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. Look at verse 6 of John 19. The chief priests and the temple police saw him. They shouted, crucify, crucify. 
Pilate responded, take him and crucify him yourselves because I find no grounds for charging him. Verse 7, we have a law, the Jews replied to him. And according to that law, he must die because he made himself the son of God. And when Pilate heard this statement, he was more afraid than ever before. Pilate is terrified by all this. All of his plans to release Jesus have backfired. Pilate's passion for power and position have corrupted him so much that he cannot even take a stand against the people. His identity is wrapped up in being somebody important so he can't go against the crowd and the people. He'd lose everything he has worked so hard for, and that's exactly why the crowds are upset with Jesus as well. Jesus is a threat to them because they will lose everything that they worked hard in their religion and self-righteousness. Everyone in this scene stands to lose their identity if they side with Jesus because Jesus has to take center stage on their lives, not the backstage. Friends, we have to be prepared to suffer if we're going to see a gospel resurgence and see God's kingdom come to bear on people through us. And by suffering, I don't mean people mocking you for the gospel. By suffering, I mean going into places of suffering and injustice. We are called as the bride of Christ, as the body of Jesus, to go into places where there is the powerless, there's the weak, there's the broken. And we're called to use our power and influence and gifts as an in investment into their lives. Change at the surface can be accomplished through programs, but change beneath the surface is going to take relationships. It's going to require more time, more energy, more money than one program will ever do. To the Apostle Paul, a gospel resurgent looked like barriers being broken down, people loving each other that didn't love each other before, relationships restored that were once damaged and unrepairable. Ephesians 2, Paul says it this way, for Jesus himself is our peace who has made both groups into one and broke down the dividing barrier of the wall so that in himself he might make the two become one man, thus establishing peace and might reconcile them both to one body in God through the cross so that no, you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and you are part of God's house. See, this is the implication of us being justified by God. Being justified was never simply a, hey, now you're free to get out of jail and you don't have to go to hell. It opened the gates to freedom, to reconciliation, to wholeness inside and out. It puts you into contact with the outsider, the person who will make you feel uncomfortable. My friends, if the gospel has not caused you to suffer, if the gospel hasn't caused you to suffer in who you love, if it hasn't caused you to break down the barriers of friendship and relationships of those of a different tribe, of those of a different race, of those of a different age, of those of a different culture, of those of a different ethnicity, of those of a different social economic barrier, friends, and you, don't, you haven't known the gospel. You really haven't gotten the gospel. If we want to see a gospel resurgence, we need humility, we need truth, we need suffering, Number four, we need faith. We need faith. See, as we seek to see lives changed in the world, as we seek to get the gospel out and use our time, talents, and gifts, and treasure to make Jesus known, we must retain our faith in a sovereign good God. This is a quick point, but it's an important point. The world is an ugly place at many times. It can be downright scary and feel overwhelming. Without a firm belief in the sovereign hand of God, we will cower away. We will, we will hide away and pitch a tent in the mountains and pray for the rapture to happen. But here we find Jesus affirming that all that's going to happen in this apparent power struggle, at, that he is still under control. As a matter of fact, there really isn't a power struggle at all that's happening here. Jesus is willingly submitting himself to the authority that he himself has established. Look at verse 10. So Pilate said to him, you're not talking to me? Don't you know that I have the authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? I love Jesus' response. You don't have any authority over me. If I hadn't given you that authority, you wouldn't have any authority. This is why the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Here's Pilate. Here, I want to show you what power I have. 
I want to show you how control I am. I want to show you how important I am, how powerful I am. Pilate thinks that he's the one calling shots here. But Jesus just looks at him and says, you're not calling the shots. I am. I'm in control every second, every detail here. God has given Pilate authority and influence and power. The whole situation happened under the guidance of God's sovereign hand. And though it was all in God's control and plan, the ones who delivered Jesus are still responsible and culpable. You see, Jesus wasn't the only one being carried along by the current, his, current of history and the claws of culture. Pilate was. Pilate was the one that was captured here. Only one person in this entire scene was free, and that was Jesus. Pilate, the soldiers, the crowds, they were all in bondage to fears and the demands of their culture. Jesus could have stopped the beatings anytime he wanted, but he didn't. Again, we find the one who possessed all power willingly gave it up to serve and to love us. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. By not taking over the scene and subjecting himself to Pilate, Jesus is showing that the gospel will go forward, but also how? Who will go forward with? The seeming powerless will become powerful. And see, this is what we see happen in the book of Acts. The gospel went forth through simple people who trusted in God's sovereignty and gave him the glory. You've heard me quote this verse before, Corinthians. Consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. We need humility. We need truth. We need faith. We need suffering. And finally, we need grace. For a gospel resurgence, a change to happen in our hearts and the hearts of those around us will only happen when we come face to face with the grace of God. Because when a person is overwhelmed by the grace of God, that Jesus would die for such a sinner as I, he or she will then be able to give of themselves in such a way that they don't have to expect anything in return. As we're going to see, Pilate has been corrupted by power. His identity, his personhood, his significance is wrapped up in being somebody and making a name for himself. This is why he can't release Jesus. Jesus must die because Pilate's reputation and livelihood is riding on pleasing the crowds to keep his job. And thus, in this incident we, see a weak, incident, we see a weak man who is concerned for his job and doesn't want the Jews complaining about him anymore. He wanted to do the right thing, but he doesn't have the courage to defy the Jews to do it. Pilate ultimately crucifies Jesus just to keep his job. He tried to put the responsibility on the Jews, said, you judge him. He tried to find a way of escape. He's released another prisoner. He tried compromise. Hey, I'll just beat him a little bit. He tried reasoning. He goes in and out seven times with Jesus talking to him. And he even tried an emotional appeal by bringing Jesus' bloody body and bruise before the crowd saying, hey, just let him go. None of it worked. Look at verse 12. And from that moment, Pilate made every effort to release him. But then the Jews shouted, if you release this man, you're not Caesar's friend. Anyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. And when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside. He sat down on the judge's place, bench in a place called the stone pavement. So the crowd now puts Pilate in this bind. Pilate loves his power. He loves his position. He loves the authority that he has. He loves it so much that he's not willing to give it up. And once he realized he could have he could have to either choose to release Jesus and lose his political position or 
crucify Jesus and keep his position. Think about Pilate for a second. Probably as a boy, he dreamed of being somebody someday. As a young man, he was no doubt enamored by the stories of Rome and the glory of Rome and all of its might. And then one day he became a soldier. He got a taste of what it was like to be a soldier in the Roman army. And yet he still longed for more success. Finally, he comes to the fabled city of Rome. It was breathtaking. The forum, the Colosseum, the palaces, the technology, the women. He ached to ascend to power to be a success. So he marries Claudia, the granddaughter of the emperor Augustus. He would do anything to succeed. And finally, the small town boy from a little province of Spain becomes the governor of Judea. He made it. He reaches the heights, but it leaves him empty. He wanted to make a difference. He wanted to be remembered for something. He wanted to be a somebody, but he couldn't find it in position and power. This is every human being. This is you and I without Jesus. You and I have been created for greatness, but that greatness is not found by looking into a mirror or giving out orders or having people applaud you. It is found by looking at Jesus who, out of greatness, laid aside ultimate power to die for you. It is being brought into that greatness by submission to Jesus and confession of inability that creates people who become world changers and a gospel resurgence begins to take place. People who can freely give and serve because their identity and their name is wrapped up in Jesus' performance, not ours. And so it's over for Jesus. He's going to be taken and he's going to be crucified. I want you to notice something here. The Gospel of John says that Jesus' death sentence was announced from a stone pavement. Why would John include that little statement? I think John is going to show us here how the Gospel is going to be spread. You know what that stone pavement was? It was a mosaic. It was a platform that was made by an artist who would take broken fragments and would put them together. A mosaic is where brokenness is made into something beautiful, where randomness is made into purpose, where disunity is made into unity, and yet diversity which is held together in a beautiful tension. See, this is exactly what Jesus would do. He would take broken lives, like you and I. You and I who try to find our identity in the world, but then discover the world would never give us joy and satisfaction. But now we find our identity in Jesus, and he would create this mosaic called the church. A collection of broken people made whole by the cross who will move out with his gospel and proclaim it and serve in light of it all because of his grace and by his grace. Friends, you and I, broken people, messed up people, Jesus brings us together. And he says, you and I, together, have within us, by the grace of God, to create a gospel resurgence in our city. That when we get the gospel and we understand what Jesus did, we begin to live in humility. We begin to stand for truth. We begin to go next to those who suffer. We get to live by faith and we live it because we have seen the grace of God in our lives. If we get this, our city will be changed. If we get this, we will see people in our lives be changed. But when we move from humility to saying, oh, we need to have positions of power and authority, nothing happens. I think it's fitting that this is where we are as we celebrate eight years as a church. 
that as a church, that if God is calling us to be in this city and for this city, that the only way we're going to make a difference in this city is if we live in humility. Even as a community to say, hey, we're not better than anyone else. God didn't save us so that we could say, hey, come look at us. God redeemed us so that we could say, in humility, we will serve those around us. That as a church, that we would never compromise the truth of the gospel. That we would faithfully preach his word day in and day out. As a church, we will stand with those who suffer. That we would be a voice. Speak when people are hurting, when people are suffering, when injustice happens. That we don't say, oh, that's something politicians need to take care of. That we be a voice for those who are hurting. That we be a church of great faith in Jesus that says, God, you are in control no matter how bad things look out there. No matter how ugly it is, God, you, this is your world. You've made it. You are in control. We will live by faith in Jesus. That if we would be people of grace, people who will offer grace, that we wouldn't judge and condemn, but in grace we will point people to Jesus as we go to communion. Would you reflect on what you're living for? Are you living to make a name for yourself? Are you living for what you see in the mirror? Are you living for the applause of men? Are you willing to trust God's sovereign hand with your future, your tomorrow, your today? What about your time, your talents, your treasure? What about your God-given power and influence? What about recognizing the places where God has placed you, your jobs, your schools, your families? Are you using all those things that God has given you to make much of Jesus? Or are you using it to serve or to be served? Are you willing to suffer alongside others to empathize with them and see the gospel go forward on your back? Have you placed your hope in kings and princes or politicians, in presidents or politics? Or do you need to come back to rest in Jesus? Has the gospel of Jesus changed you from the inside out, not the outside in? Father, this morning as we're here, Would your Holy Spirit make us a people of humility? People that recognize that you didn't need to choose us. You didn't choose us because we were the best out there, we were the wealthiest out there, we had the most influence out there. And yet you and your grace, you chose us. We didn't find you. You found us. May we be humble people. Not one of arrogance that demands our way or our desires or what we want more than anything else. May we be individually and as a community known for humility. Father, maybe we, may we be people of truth. People that find ways to keep pointing back to Jesus. In our conversations with those around us, with our loved ones, would you help us to find ways to point them to you? Because our man-made solutions will never work. Jesus is the way the truth, the life. Father, in a world of brokenness, would you allow us to be people that come along, those who are suffering, those who are hurting? Because this is what you did. You left the riches of heaven and you suffered 
for us. And Father, despite everything that goes on around us, despite all the brokenness, all the corruption, all the destruction, may we not despair or panic or grow weak and tired, but would you allow us to be people of faith, to trust, to say that it might be bad today, but God is still on his throne. And that God is in control of every detail, of every situation, of every circumstance. And that we trust that there will be a day where you will make all things right. And Father, finally, would you make us people of grace? The grace that has been given to us, would we allow us, would you give us the ability to extend that to others? May we be people who will find Jesus working in the lives of people around us and be gracious to people around us. Father, this is our prayer for us individually. This is our prayer for us as a church. That as we desire to see Jesus made much of in this city, may it not be done by anything we do, but may it be done in submission to all the things that you desire. But Father, be glorified through us, we pray. We thank you for Jesus. We love you.